You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. March 29th is now officially recognized as National Vietnam Veterans Day. And with that in mind, we're hosting a show about the photography of U.S. servicemen and women who captured their experiences while serving in Vietnam in the late 1960s and early 1970s. This is not about the photojournalism that is so embedded in our consciousness, but the images taken by soldiers themselves, some of which depict aspects of combat, but much more as a blend of the mundane details of army life, photos of friends and comrades, and even something close to tourist photos of the land and people of Vietnam. To join us for this conversation, we are fortunate enough to have Kendra Rennick of the Vietnam Slide Project, of which we will talk about in more detail during the second half of our show. But first, we're going to be joined by David Parks, who in 1968 authored a book, G.I. Diary, chronicling his nine-month combat duty in Vietnam and including not only his written work, but many accompanying photographs. Upon his return from Vietnam, his diary was published by Harper and Row. It's a nuanced description of war from the grunt's perspective, and it does not shy away at all from issues of race, injustice, and barbaric activities. It's not surprising that David Parks, who is the son of legendary photographer Gordon Parks, would be interested and adept at capturing these images. But the why and how of documenting combat experience while fighting and surviving are what we'll be discussing today. Joining us from Austin, Texas, welcome David. Well, thank you for having me. Our pleasure. David, allow me to introduce for our listeners the context of your creating uh, this document. And correct me if the description is not accurate as I go along. Here's a little bit of bullets of your story. You grew up with a degree of privilege not common to African Americans. Your father was an artist, photographer, and filmmaker named Gordon Parks. And you attended boarding schools in which you were often the only black face in the crowd. You attended college but were not happy with school life, and you dropped out knowing it was going to cost you a deferment. You wanted to serve your country, and you were drafted in 1965. You spent a year in basic training and the better part of a year in Vietnam itself. You were a crewman in an armored personnel carrier and led search and destroy missions in the jungle and in villages. You were injured and earned a Purple Heart when your vehicle ran over a mine and you returned to combat a few weeks after the attack. While in Vietnam, you applied and were accepted at Rochester Institute of Technology, which you attended after you made it home. Now, obviously, you grew up around photography, but did you consider yourself a photographer when you joined the Army, or did photography take on a life of its own once you were there and you started looking around you? Well, uh, no, I I mean, I have been around photography all my my life, and I worked with Dad a lot uh, as an assistant and Loading cameras, carrying cameras. I, I did a lot of traveling with him when I was young. So I, I was familiar with photography, but I did not go to, I did not take pictures specifically to have a book published or uh, an article done on me uh, as far as GI Diary. It, it just evolved, okay? I, I, a little question now. You, you said you traveled with your dad a lot and you assisted him, and I'm sure that was an amazing experience. Was this at your request, or did he insist that you be there as, as his, his pack mule and assistant? Which way did it go? <laughs> uh, it was kind of automatic, you know. Uh, he took uh, my brother, Gordon Parks Jr., along a number of times. Uh, we lived in Europe traveled with him when he worked for Life International. So it was, uh, I had a foundation of, of photography, but when I went to Vietnam, I took the suggestion of my father. I told him I was getting bored in the military. So he, he suggested that I keep a diary and take some photographs to keep, keep my mind going. Gotcha. Now, many of your many of your photographs they depict prisoners and combat activities. Some of them are very uh, photojournalistic. Did people object to your shooting? Uh, can you speak about any pushback you might have gotten from other soldiers and officers when you took a camera out and started photographing what was happening? Well, when I uh, was in Nam, I 
I took the candid approach. You know, many of them didn't know I was photographing them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it was not uh, legal to to have a camera in the battlefield, so I had to keep it undercover. And um, if you notice, many of the photographs uh, do not. You cannot recognize the people from front point of view. Uh, the ones that you do see were were killed in action. So you did that purposely. I had did no you... releases. Up ah, front. okay. Now, did you take pictures other than? Did you take pictures with faces that were recognizable, or as you were shooting, were you taking pictures knowing that you just couldn't use some of them ever, except for personal use? So, did you edit yourself as you went uh, along? Yeah, uh, pretty much 50-50, pretty much 50-50. Uh, when, we got, when I got back and I was working with Harper and Rowe editing the photographs uh, in, in regards to the text, uh, I did not have releases, okay? Mm-hmm. And so we, we decided to keep the uh, photographs of the people that... Uh, were were uh, still alive. Uh, we took them out. The people that you see pictures of were uh, were killed in action. There's a few photos that depict Vietnamese prisoners and what I would call sensitive scenes. Were these photos you're saying you just kind of took them on the sly? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, again, we weren't supposed to have cameras in the field. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And on operations. Now you, you uh, keep... so I, I kept it pretty well undercover. I mean, a lot of things were going on, so nobody really noticed me. Mm-hmm. And were you thinking at if the you time? Know what I mean. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine uh, with the chaos around. Um, were you uh, at the time thinking of this just as your own personal diary, uh, or were you thinking in terms of photojournalism and trying to document something? Well, I, I, I um, as, a, uh, as you know, I grew up you know, mm-hmm. under a, a photojournalist, right? Right. So I had an idea of how to approach the photography. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, mainly, I it was candid. People didn't know I was shooting them. Uh, so uh, I did take it a, a photojournalist approach. Uh, when I got back to the States and went to Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, I took the course uh, in uh, photojournalism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So and, that was my interest. And how many uh, photos did you take, would you say? I mean, can you put a number on it? Were you shooting all the time? I wasn't shooting all the time. I took them when, I, when the opportunity presented itself. But don't forget, I was in combat and I had a job to do. Of course, yeah. And, uh, but I... I Took them periodically when I could. I had to protect the cameras to the humidity and the and the wet area that I was in in the Delta. Really made it hard to keep the the film dry and keep the cameras from getting corroded. What cameras did you use? Uh, should I assume you were shooting with Nikon F's or Leicas? No, I was shooting. Uh, believe it or not, I shot with a Nikon SP which is a range finder. Oh, sure, yeah, okay. And I uh, had a Pentex uh, uh, single-lens reflex uh, as a backup camera. Hmm. And okay. so th- those were the two cameras I had over there. And was it just a uh, black and white film, or did you play with color as well? No, no. It wasn't all black and white. I took some color. Uh, uh, being in the jungle and the canopy prevented you from really using slow film. So I uh, shot a lot of black and white and uh, triax and basically I had, I had uh, color and black and white. And some of the colors you see in the, some of the black and white you see in the book uh, were color. We, we just, uh, right. Right. Uh, printed in black and white. And where did you get the film from? Where I get it from? Yeah. <laughs> 
I got it out of the refrigerator at my father's house. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you actually, everything you shot, you brought over with you? I, I, I borrowed it. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I borrowed the film. And I'm sure you returned it when you were finished with it, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, if, if soldiers went to Saigon, was it possible to buy film and cameras and... Or was was it impossible to yeah, get? Yeah, I mean, you could, uh, you know, yeah, you could, you could get into certain townships, hamlets that sold film, but I, I didn't have to do that. I had a I had a pretty good load of film, uh-huh. you know. Uh, how did you manage to keep your film dry? Because you, you're in a real heavy duty, humid, oh, tropic oh, environment. Yeah, yeah, well, no, I, yeah, yeah, I, I uh, kept it wrapped in plastic. You must have added a little extra weight to your pack then if you had two cameras and, and a load of film. I mean, did you carry it with you everywhere? Uh, well, I didn't carry the film, all the stuff at once, you know. Right. So, sometimes I'd take one camera out, mm-hmm. you know. No, I, 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 I didn't take all that film with me when I was in the... I left it at base gotcha. camp, you know, where it was pretty dry, mm-hmm. you know. But I did wrap it in, uh, sealed it in um, plastic, uh bags so mm-hmm. it wouldn't uh it wouldn't get any moisture in there okay and what about processing did you send everything back to the states once you once you shot a roll well that's an interesting story uh cbs were filming my unit out in the field and more Ma- maury safer was there uh doing the interview and doing the commentary uh at the time, right? Mm-hmm. So one day, uh, one day I went over to him and I said, "Look, uh, my name's David Parks, and I was wondering if you could uh, get this film back to my father." Uh, and he knew my father, so he said, uh, "Not a problem." So I got the film out to Maury paper. Huh. <laughs> so that was a coup. <laughs> I don't think I would have gotten all that film out. I would not have gotten all that film out if I had to send it to regular channels. They would have, uh, they would have screened it. Hey, he was a cool dude. Though. We got along real good. But what he did was, what he did was, he took the film, got it back to uh, New York, and took it over to Life Magazine, and Life Magazine got it, got it to my father. Life Magazine did all the development. Did you get uh, feedback from anybody at that point? I mean, did your father take a look at the images or any of the editors or was just sitting there waiting for your return? No, Life Magazine went ahead and developed it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they gave the, the uh, they gave prints to my father. Uh, at that time, my father still was associated with Life Magazine. Mm-hmm. So they, they filed it away. They were interested in, in doing the book or doing the article, but something happened between my agent and them and it never worked out. So he went and shopped it over at Look Mag- at Magazine. What kind of feedback did you get from your dad? Was he uh, critiquing your work as you went along, uh, uh, either through your permission or just doing it because he's your dad? Well, no, the old man had an interesting way of critiquing. Uh, he never really critiqued the composition or, you know, he, he would single out certain shots that he thought were really good, but he, he, uh, he always, always told us that if I don't say anything, you're in good shape. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was his way of critiquing. <laughs> in the written aspect of the diary, you talk uh, about issues of race and you even talk about some of the atrocities that you, you witnessed when you were photographing, did you did you think to find images to document or, or to uh, illustrate the points you were writing about, or was that something that came after the fact and then you, you you pieced together the diary with the images that you had? Well, I talk about it, you know, when I, when I was there, but no, I didn't go ahead and photograph those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that wasn't my priority to to show the the horror of war. Mm-hmm. I was just basically trying to document what we were doing and what what it was like. In, what it was like in Vietnam, you okay. know. Uh, a lot of the pictures of the are the people themselves, you know. Were you able to ever ever be able to be in these villages in these little towns and hamlets and 
feel really comfortable or did you always have to be on edge, not knowing exactly who you were talking to? Yeah, it was a little nerve wracking because you got to understand the VC or the Viet Cong were a people's army. And they, they were basically made up of people from those hamlets in that area. So it was very difficult to get intelligence on what was happening. What about photographing in these villages? Were you able to interact and even ask for portraits and take images of, uh, of the Vietnamese? They actually kind of like being photographed. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. uh, again, uh, I was shooting them. They, they really didn't know I was shooting them. I, uh, I shoot candidly. I shoot uh, without, without people knowing I'm shooting them. That's, that's been my style. Since I started working uh, in, in photography, I, mm -hmm. I don't like set up shots. I don't like to do commercial shots. You know, right. I'm, 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 I'm more reportage, as they say in yeah. the old days. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Well, there's one. So, uh, there's one great photo you have uh, that's really just a portrait of another serviceman, an African American serviceman, and I'm looking at it here in the in the Look magazine. Uh, do you remember who that, that soldier was? He, he was a, a forward observer like me. Mm -hmm. There were three of us in our company. Okay. And he was one of them. He got killed uh, oh, about six months into the action. Mm. So that, that's why I was able to use that photograph. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a powerful know, shot. Yeah, it's a powerful York. image. Yeah. They didn't use it in the book. No? They didn't use it in the book, but they did use it in the Look Magazine. See, Look Magazine took a different approach than Harper and Rowe did. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, my book was the first book published on Vietnam by a major uh, publisher. Uh, second of all, they were a little nervous about publishing this book. Uh, so the, the title they gave, gave it was GI Diary. Well, look at it right. Uh, they, they, they they gave the title of the article Vietnam uh, Diary, mm -hmm. which is what I thought it should have been anyway. But they were a little nervous about doing that. Okay, uh, uh, Harper and Rowe. But yeah, I can imagine. Magazine's got to sell magazines. I do own the rights to all the photographs uh, from Look and Life because Look Magazine defunct and uh, those those were just used for the article and. Harper Row defunct, so all the rights of the book referred it to me. Do you still have the negatives? I do not have the negatives that were uh, in the book or the article. Hmm. I had copies of all of it, but my lab in New York burned down, and I lost all of that stuff. Oh, jeez. That stinks. I want to ask you, first of all, how was the book received, and, and did... did did it change your life a little bit when the book came out? Because as you mentioned, it was, you know, one of the first books uh, on Vietnam. Uh, the subject matter was very serious. The, you weren't shying away from from many things that people, I'm sure, did not want to hear. So and, so, and the war was not. It's still very unpopular at that point. This is 1968. I mean, yeah. it's so. How uh, how did that affect you in the immediate uh, aftermath of the book coming out? Well, after the book came out. I went on a book tour across the country, mm -hmm. did a lot of interviews with uh, magazines, newspapers, television. Uh, that that kind of changed my life. Yeah. <laughs> that was worse than Vietnam <laughs> <laughs> because I was being asked questions in a very aggressive way because of the nature of the, of the war. Mm -hmm. It was not a popular war. And people were trying to dig into, you know, all aspects of it especially the negative aspects of it. But, you know, I, I didn't have a problem with that. It was on the top 10 list of uh, books sold and, at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's gone into various institutions, high schools, schools, colleges. Yeah. So Around how many copies have been sold? I really never got that last figure. If I did, it's in my... It's in my storage. <laughs> right. I really, I really didn't, I don't have a total, but I know it was, uh, it had three, three printings. Okay? okay, that's respectable. Okay. Uh, yeah, it had three printings, and 
you know, I made a good living off. Is there any uh, chance or is there any opportunity to have a republishing, another printing? Uh, there is a chance, I would say. I have some people out here in Kansas, for example, are interested in doing a feature film on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've been in negotiations with them in regards to the, the feature film. Okay. Uh, then that would I, that would give an opportunity to have it republished through the uh, distributor who ends up distributing the film. So yeah. that's that's a possibility. Well, that'd be good. As far as any other publisher is concerned, no, there's there's you know it's it's out of date as far as getting a publisher mm-hmm. to republish it. Mm-hmm. And they generally don't do that anyway. They don't publish somebody else's book. Anyway. And can you uh, tell me? Did you um, did you see a lot of other soldiers with cameras? And can you talk a little bit about the photography of it? Because uh, the guest on the second half of our show is uh, organizing a collection of of photos taken by soldiers in Vietnam. And uh, I'm just curious as to what your impression was of people who were taking pictures. I, I, I saw soldiers taking photographs when you were in base camp, for example. Snapshots from Kodak Instamatics, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was in base camp. Right. But when we went out into the field on operations, no. Nobody ever took any photographs out there. Yeah. Not, not from the, the unit I was in. Yeah, it seems to me that if you're out on a combat mission... The last thing you know, you, you're the people you're with. The other soldiers want you is take out a camera to take pictures. Hey, no, hell no, they ain't gonna take no camera out. They're gonna be shooting at the enemy. <laughs> right. Okay. But uh, no, not, as I said, they had Instamatic, Kodak, and some stuff like that. Once we got back to base camp, and they would take photographs of their buddies, and then they would send those photographs back to their parents. But nothing in combat. Uh, I, I, in my unit, I was the only one taking photographs in the field and I wasn't taking that many. I mean, I, I, there were times where the situation allowed for it, uh, you know, but I was a forward observer. My, my job wasn't to look for the enemy. My job was to know where we were, be able to call in artillery and airstrikes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I had a I had a sniper who protected my back. I had a radio telephone operator who carried the radio, and they protected me because if we couldn't call in airstrikes or mortars or artillery, we were in trouble. Okay. <clears throat> so my my primary duty was to uh, do that kind of a job. Uh, my job wasn't to hunt down a uh, sniper or whatever shoot the enemy. Uh, of course, when we got into uh, active combat on the ground, uh, yeah, I, I had to go and take a gun and do it, you know. Mm-hmm. But my job was a forward observer. So in, in, in your nine months uh, in Vietnam, do you, can you put a number on the uh, amount of images that you took or a number of roles, or do you have any recollection of that? Well, let's put it this way. I took a whole bag of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When I handed Maury the, the, the plastic bag, there it was filled up. Okay. <laughs> but it, it wasn't that much. It's a no-no to take photographs in a combat situation, and it's a no-no to take uh, photographs in a uh, training situation. You don't take photographs of those things because it does show uh, anyone like the enemy what you have, the kind of guns you have. It, it's, True. It's an intelligence thing. Sure. Okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. There were times where Stars and Stripes would send out a, uh, a reporter and a cameraman, uh, a photographer, to shoot photographs of what we were doing. But that was it. I mean, <laughs> none of the soldiers took cameras into the field. That that was a no-no. Let me ask you. You know, obviously, you you know, you had uh, a provenance. You had a, a famous photographer father. Y- you had an agent. Sounds like, um, but you also wrote you know, some very powerful words and, and some, some, some criticisms, uh, as well as, you know, well, thank you. uh, were you surprised by the, uh, the attention the book received? Were you, were you surprised that it got published at all? And, uh, and what's your feeling? What was your feeling? I was surprised that it was published. Mm-hmm. What happened was uh, the old man got the photographs and everything later 
before I came back. But I would send him letters about what was going on. I also uh, was able to bring into those letters some of the diary. Actually, I sent most of the diary back with the photographs. Okay, mm-hmm. it just so happened that a uh, editor from Pub- Harper and Row was at my father's apartment, right? And the uh, postman brought a, a letter from me from Vietnam, and my father's assistant grabbed and said, "Hey, you got a letter from David." And so the my father was there with the editor, and he started reading the the letters. And uh, he started reading it, and she was very, she says, wow, this is pretty interesting stuff, you know? Uh, oh, he says, I got a whole, I got a pile of it over here. And she started going through it, and she says, you know, this would make a good book. And that's how it got happened. That's how it happened. Hmm. And this is all why you See? were still over there. I was still over there when that, when that decision was made. Right. And then... Uh, so it, it wasn't that I went over there to write a book or to do a book and photograph and get them. I just did it to keep my mind, you know, uh, functioning. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's basically it. And it gave me a particular kind of uh, uh, relief. And that's what it did for me. And I got a lot of the crap out, yeah, especially in the writing. You know? That's great. All right, Dave, uh, any um, any future projects you're working on that you'd like to tell us about? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, 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 <laughs> I'm fine, though. I'm, I'm down here in Texas. I got an independent film company, uh, and uh, I'm doing independent documentaries on Texas history, and... Uh, Really enjoying uh, learning about a different way of life other than New York City. David Parks, thank you so, so much for joining us today. And uh, uh, again, good luck on everything you're doing. Well, thank you for uh, taking the time to interview me about the book. Okay, we're going to take a short break and we come back. We're going to be speaking with Kendra Rennick of the Vietnam Slide Project. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. Kendra Rennick is originally from Massachusetts. She studied photography at the Rochester Institute of Technology and works as a photo editor for Getty Images and MTV. Long involved in archiving, she's the founder of the Vietnam Slide Project, which is an archive of slides taken during the Vietnam War, not by journalists, but by soldiers who actually did the fighting. The project began when a friend's father passed away and left her a trove of color slides he had taken during his tour of action. The photographs needed a home and a purpose, and so began the Vietnam Slide Project. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. So, is that a pretty accurate uh, introduction there? Could you give us a little more background into what had this develop? Sure. So, I had a a very close friend of mine whose father passed away in 2015, Mm -hmm. and he had never really talked about his time in Vietnam. That was never something that she had heard stories of as a kid. Okay. It was kind of undiagnosed PTSD type of situation. Um, So as he was terminal, he passed away from melanoma. He started to talk about his experience a little bit as he was towards the end of his life. He mentioned that he had this collection of slides and having a photo background as her friend, she asked me if I could digitize them for her so she could see them because most people don't have a way of looking at those other than holding them up to the lights. Yeah, slide projectors, they're they're, rare animals these days. Yeah, they're hard to find. Yeah. So I scanned them for her and thought about other people in my life that had a relative or a close friend that had served in Vietnam, and maybe they had slides as well, because I know that was a popular medium back then. So I started to ask around a little bit and found that other people in my life also had um, similar experience where these slides had been kind of kept in a basement. No one had looked at them since maybe their time over there Mm. in some cases. So can I ask, I mean, this is your friend's father, and... I'm assuming that most of your connection then would have come through the generation above you, your parents' age and and folks. What was your, you know, your feelings or your understanding of the Vietnam War as, let's say, you're growing up in your teens and 20s? So, obviously, it was taught in school. 
And it was something that pop culture has always had a reference to Forrest Gump, the music, the clothes. That that era is something that has always sort of been romanticized to my generation, I think. And my parents have always had the mindset and told me about so-and-so served in Vietnam. You know, we don't really talk about that. They, you know, that was such a hard time for them. Or it's kind of unspoken as well. Um, so... There's a little bit of mystery to it to me, which kind of intrigues me to, to hear more about firsthand accounts other than, of course, the history books and sort of what I'm told from teachers and that sort of thing. And were you familiar with some of the the more well-known images? Or I mean, you're in the photography business, so I'm assuming that, you know, Nick Utz photo of the girl burning from napalm uh, and these images that... Eddie are, Adams are, photograph. Eddie Adams photo that are like so mm-hmm. much a part of my upbringing anyway, and I think the culture in general... You were aware of that, and yes. and the general idea that Vietnam was kind of the first war that came through our television sets, and and this idea where media and war interact was was a big part of Vietnam. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah I was very familiar with I think some of those iconic images in a way that I was a little bit awestruck by that because I don't think my generation, especially when I was learning about it in high school, had ever kind of had a war that close to home for us. So hearing about my parents talk about their age group, learning about it, and as it was happening, I think the images that came out of that were really just sort of horrific for me to see. So Now, when we talk about um, iconic images from Vietnam, they're almost always grainy black and white photographs. And this is about color slides. Now, is that because the initial, that the seed of this project was in the form of color slides, a friend's father passed away and gives you a box of color slides? Um, and now that's the, that's the vehicle of this project. Um, are you considering or looking at anything that might have been shot on color negative or black and white negative, which I'm assuming was more common to shoot? Than color slides. Color, I mean, I come from the from the age of color slides, and the only reason I really shot is because that's what magazines needed and required. They needed transparencies, positive images. But why were soldiers shooting color slide film, especially with slow ISO and everything else? Yeah. So I've always really loved slide film. Mm-hmm. Being someone who studied photography, I think it's kind of an aggressive, difficult medium. The the, you have a very small range that you can get the exposure right. I oh, think yeah. it's kind of a you tricky... you got to be accurate. It's a really... I always enjoyed that. So knowing that people that hadn't studied photography had taken slide film with them or had bought it overseas and decided to shoot with it, I thought was so interesting. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. love the idea that slide film originally was intended to be shown to an audience. You you got a, a carousel, you put it on a projector, and you kind of you know, showed your family vacation photos on a wall and made like a little presentation out of what you shot. So the idea that someone would be doing that, maybe not knowing what they were going to get into in Vietnam and thinking they'd come home and show a presentation. And then a lot of them have told me that they just didn't show anyone the photos. So I like the idea that the original intention was to be shown to an audience and then all of a sudden it just lives in a carousel in the basement and it hasn't been touched since. So I think that was probably part of the intrigue. And I think We've all seen, sla- um, sorry, we've all seen black and white photos and we've all seen regular photographs. So the idea of having this project be a little bit more narrowed down was pretty interesting to me. Well, by the way, if anybody thinks that they're going to look at this and see dynamic combat photographs, they're not. Right. They're actually very mundane, mm-hmm. common snapshots of downtime during the war. Mm-hmm. Well, I think this also speaks to the the difference between negatives and slides because the journalists were were shooting you know black and white negatives in most cases, and the slides were for tourist photos and vacation photos. So that's what the soldiers, not being professionals, would have gravitated to. But let me ask you: I mean, you talked about the difficulty of exposing slides when you when you've gotten a collection of photos. How many of them are even? usable or or viewable in terms of the exposure? I find a lot of them are not properly exposed. I think they'll be, I get anywhere between a few small boxes of slides or three carousels from different collections. Each person has taken the time to shoot different amounts. But um, I would say that there's a small percentage that I'm able to use. I try to not look at it with a technical eye. I try to kind of 
keep in mind that these are not technical photographs. And I like the idea that some of them might have like a finger in front of the lens or a little bit out of focus. Then it shows kind of the idea that it's not a professional photographer. Something else that you have going on with color slides is that, first of all, uh, for listeners who have not ever shot color slides, you have very little latitude. You have to be within about a quarter of a stop, a third of a stop. And and again, back then in the 60s, the meters and camera, there was a meter that showed you had to set the exposure, but you had to understand what you were setting it to, to have it come out. It was, there was no such thing as automatic or program. So your exposures had to be set manually and they had to be accurate within a third of a stop. And another problem that you have is that unless the film is Kodachrome, which is an amazing amount of resilience as far as lasting for decades. I've seen Kodachromes from World War II that are astounding. If you're shooting an E6 film, uh, ectochrome with most common, the colors are already shifting right now. We're talking about 50 years, and that film, past 20 years, there was no guarantee on it. And it starts to getting color shifts and fading and getting thin. So you have a lot of technical things going against you. You're kind of playing beat the clock here, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how the collections come to me. So they'll be... A, a really neatly packed carousel wrapped in bubble wrap with p packing peanuts and it's really carefully kept and sent to me in the, this wonderful package and then I've and gotten... And then you get the litter box. Yeah, I have a cigar box, box with like a plastic <laughs> bag around it and some of them have water damage, they're covered in dust and I think that almost adds to it a little bit. It kind of goes against my technical background to not want to take out every amount of dust but I think it adds to the fact that these are older photos. So. What scanners are you using? Or scanner? So I have a flatbed scanner, and I also have like a little Wolverine scanner that people archive their own slides with. The reason why I know that I could probably, you know, have access to a drum scanner and really get these large prints out of these, but like I said, some of them are not necessarily worth scanning at the highest resolution. So I try to do a lower res to just have an idea of what I have. And then if I really like something, bring it to a lab and get a better quality scan of it. Because if I'm getting about 500 slides from one person, it's just I don't have the bandwidth. To do you eyeball them on a light box with a I loop? I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I still have my light yeah. box and loop too, my little Schneider loop. I still got it. Yeah. <laughs> I, so I take a look and try to make sure that I'm not getting duplicates. I, I think some one collection someone was bracketing, I noticed. Oh, so okay. I'm trying to pick the best one and not scan every single and one. That first collection that came in, your friend's father, how, how big of a collection was that? How many slides? That was, I would say, it was less than 100. I think it f would have filled maybe one carousel. Mm. And how does that compare with the other ones? Are you getting, five, like you said, 500 from one photographer or is it usually a handful? How's that working? I would say the average is about one carousel worth of slides. And I don't know if that's because they don't know where the rest of them are or if that was just what they had shot. Or oh, that was the, that was the final edit. Yeah, that's true. Have some been <laughs> edited? Can you tell like they've only sent in them? Some the of best. them, the ones that I really like, I'm still trying to figure out a way to, to showcase this, but the slides have handwritten notes on them oh. of what's happening in the image and dates and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm toying with the idea of maybe scanning the actual slide and then scanning for the image and kind of mashing them together just so you could see some of those. Have you had a chance to do any research into some, I mean, if, let's say it comes in without any information. Uh, do you do you look into the information in terms of finding where this might have been taken or the company the guy was attached to or details that you'd have to do research to find? I've tried to match um, logos on uniforms as to which division someone is in because I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I try to have a little bit of information on each uh, veteran that's their collection that I'm showcasing. Some people don't have uh, any information associated with the veteran. A lot of collections have been submitted by family members. After the deceased or After they've anonymous. passed away. Okay. Um, and so in that case... They don't always know the specifics, which I think some people that are interested in this time period would want to know. So I try to do a little bit of justice by looking at the clothing and the markings on the planes mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And what um, what do you tell the family members if they send? I mean, what what's the relationship, or, or what do you say uh, that you'll you'll promise to keep these? The project is ongoing; the archive will continue, or is it just like, hey, I'm doing the best I can to keep this going, and uh, uh, no promises. Um, I've always agreed to send the slides back. I've had it. I don't keep any of them myself unless in some cases veterans don't want them back. Mm. So there was one gentleman that submitted to me and said 
yeah, my wife's been trying to get them out of the out of the garage for a while. You know, I don't I don't want them back. And his collection was wonderful, mm-hmm. so I I sent him back um, a digital archive of his work because I knew that he might be of interest. That might be of interest to him as well. Sure. And I said, I hope you're still taking photographs. I mean, mm-hmm. these are really good. And he was really humble about it and said, Oh, you know, I was just over there. I had a camera. I was just in the right place at the right time. So I think in in those cases, I want to make sure that. I'm keeping them in the loop of how the project is going, but maybe they don't want to hear too much about it because I think maybe for him it might have been a little painful Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But for family members, I tell them that I'll send the slides back and I'll provide a digital archive. And then I ask them if they'd like to write anything about the person that the collection is about. I've gotten some interesting essays and letters from people and just sort of, I have like an open discourse if they want to kind of vent or talk about things. With How me. are you advertising or promoting this project? How are people finding out about it? Um, the first and most successful way that people found out about the project was the Vietnam Veterans of America have a website. Okay. And they have a arts and culture section. Mm-hmm. So this gentleman named Mark Leapson runs that um, account. And I messaged him and I said, I'm working on a project. I'm curious if you would be interested in maybe messaging or putting out some sort of email to people that are in your network. That's a natural for them. And yeah, and they, he wrote up a little, a little blurb about it. And then people started contacting me from that. A couple news outlets have picked up the project and written about it. And then people have contacted me that way. So I haven't done too much self-promoting because I almost don't feel like it's quite at a place where I, at first it wasn't at a place where I was ready to self-promote it. But I wanted it to be something that veterans specifically were interested in before I put out like a, you know, a cattle call for anyone. What do you see as the goal of this project? What, what's, what's the end game here? What do you want to do with all these? Where do you want them to be? How, how is it going to, what, what is it going to be at the end of the day? So what's interesting is originally I started it as almost a service to people that needed a, digi- a, digi- a digital version of their slides mm-hmm. because they couldn't see them. And I just thought, oh, I have a background in this. I can I can clean them up for everyone and I can make a little archive and I can just kind of do a service for people. And then the story started and then I thought there's a little bit more to this and I'd like to see it eventually become a book. That's my my goal. Um, I would You're like... You need a good scanner, you know. Yeah, I know. I'm going to need a good <laughs> scanner. <laughs> I would also really like to have about 20 collections to make it feel cohesive. Right now I have about 14. And is that important to keep the collections of one photographer together and look at it that way through the eyes of one photographer? I'm kind of toying with the idea of keeping it per photographer, but also there's so much common, there's so many commonalities between the collections Mm -hmm, that it might mm -hmm, be nice mm -hmm. to kind of blend them together. Themes or something of that sort. Let's talk about that a bit. I mean, uh, obviously... And when we talk, we, when we discussed with David, the photographers were shooting around base camps, and and from looking over the website, guys playing guitars, shooting hoops, uh, chilling, whatever, smoking uh, them if they got them. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. So what are, what are you finding, and and what has surprised you that in some of the uh, collections? So I think for me, the I really like the photos of of the of the men. Right now it's just men, but I'm sure there's some images of women that I haven't seen yet. But for, for right now... No, no women have submitted yet? I haven't seen any images of women. There, well, I don't know. that. Well, the women were definitely not in combat in Vietnam. I don't mm-hmm. believe so at all. I don't think there was. I know there were women working in the medical fields and that sort of thing. Oh, I don't behind know. Behind the scenes, yeah. Chalk block, if, yeah. If they were, were taking photos, but if they were, I would love to see that as well. I just want everything to feel cohesive mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. to feel like I have a good a good snippet of that time period. It would be great to have that point of view. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. But getting back in general, the the shots that you're you're getting are how would you break them down? Um, I would say a lot of them are base camp shots. Mm-hmm. Um, usually I looked at the time period on most of them and I and I try to get information on when the the soldier served and I noticed that at least the slides that I'm getting seem to be the earlier portion of their tours. So maybe when they first got there and things were not as intense as they ended up being before they left. So that's common that the time Mm. period is more of the beginning of their tour. Um, I'm also noticing, I think, based on what I've heard from veterans that I've actually talked to, 
it was the first time a lot of these young guys had been overseas. Right. So the tourist photos are just because they hadn't been in another country before. They hadn't been in that sort of um, landscape. They hadn't seen... Novelty factor. Yeah, for sure. And I think being in a plane, there's a lot of photographs taken from an aerial view because that was probably the first time they had had the opportunity. So those there, there are a lot of aerial shots as well. Um, a lot of shots of Vietnamese people in the towns, a lot of shots of veterans, of soldiers at the time with children, mm -hmm. which I always find to be pretty interesting because I know that relationship may have changed throughout the course of, of the conflict, but there's a lot of photographs of townspeople. Hmm. And has, since you started it in, and when did you, when did it start? When did you get this? This really first? got going in 2016. 2016. So in the two years since, have the submissions increased? Uh, are you seeing any kind of pattern in terms of what you're receiving or does it come in waves? How, how How's the collection growing? It comes in pretty sporadically. I'm always surprised what people have, what avenue people have found my project. So mm -hmm. I, I know that Facebook is geared towards, at least now from working in social media for different jobs, um, Facebook is geared towards an older audience now in terms of who's actually on it and looking. And I know that for my parents' generation, it's a good way to connect with people that you met when you were a kid. And so I felt that having... If, you, a, if you're looking for your 50th high school anniversary, yes. <laughs> it, that, that is the go-to spot. Trust me. Yep. I think my mom was really <laughs> amazed at how many of her high school friends she could find on Facebook. You know, my generation, that doesn't really surprise us anymore. But um, <laughs> so I had... And all you have to do is press the enter button. Right. And there. It's you amazing. Just search and you can find them and they're there. <laughs> Um, so I made a Facebook page and I think a lot of people find the project on Facebook and I've gotten a lot of messages and sometimes people just want to tell me about someone that they, they knew or their parent that served in Vietnam. They may not have photos, they just want to share the story. So I think I can never tell what time of year I'm going to get more submissions or that sort of thing. It definitely is, is pretty random and I think after an article is written or something is talked about or... I've posted on a holiday that is associated. You get a, flurry. I get a little bit of a, a yeah, sure. I get a mm -hmm. little bit more. And have you had to have people sent you sli uh, negatives and you said, I'm sorry, I'm keeping this strictly to slides and send them back? Or how, how have you had to handle that? I had one gentleman send me his entire scrapbook mm. of Polaroids, which I thought was so cool, but wow, it didn't yeah. quite fit. So I photographed it all. So I have it. And I, you know, thanked him and mailed him back. And I'm hoping to, when I get more things like that, maybe have a blog section or something. Or mm -hmm. I shared them on Facebook so that people could see them. Because he had handwritten his, you know, little stories next to every slide. Wow. Uh, sorry, next to every Polaroid. So I really thought that was interesting. And I kind of just want to be able to have people feel they can share their stories. Because I know... My impression of this of this war was that people came home and didn't have any sort of pride in what they had done. It wasn't the same as people that serve today where mm -hmm. they come home and they're a little bit more celebrated. So I, I just kind of wanted to be an outlet for people to share their stories, and I, I don't and want to have turn you anyone away. found yourself getting involved with the stories? and I mean, because this can be a very emotional release for some people, I'm certain. And, yeah, uh, definitely. I had... Um, one gentleman sent me a, an essay that he had written about the three people that he had killed. So each part of, this, of the essay had to do with a person over in Vietnam that he had killed. Wow. It was beautifully written, and it was just very cathartic for him to share that with me and to have someone, I think, interested in his story. So yeah. it is a lot, and I try not to get too, too involved in multiple things at once. So I've tried to always have when I'm working on a collection, that be the only collection I'm working on and try to give that its due time and not, you know, look at too many things at once and just really dedicate to that person. Now, slides are obviously easier to review than negatives because there they are. It's, it's the real thing. It's WYSIWYG. What you see is what mm -hmm. you get. You do get negatives on occasion, and I'm sure the first reaction is, oh, God, because you know, how do you look at negatives? Do you look at the negatives? Do you actually take the time to go through them? If you do, again, just because there could be something really... I mean, you're a photo editor. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got to have this little bit of curiosity going whenever oh, you course. see an envelope. <laughs> yeah. So do, do you prowl through the negatives as well, on a, at least on occasion? I do, yeah. I mean, I try to scan everything I get, and I try to 
have a digital archive for anyone that sends something to me just as a service, like I said, and also because there might be something really great that I'd want to share. Okay. And how much time do you dedicate to this and has it become bigger than you ever thought it would? And what do you think about going forward? I think it definitely became a lot bigger than I thought it would be when I first started. Um, It's more or less a passion project for me. I don't have any funding at the moment. I'm in the process of looking for some grants and some sort of um, help there. It's just me. I have one or two friends that have offered to help me just come over and look at slides with me, but it's really just me. So being a freelancer and having a job and and trying to balance that has been a little bit difficult because my schedule is not a Monday through Friday, nine to five. There's one photographer I wanted to mention. His name is Dennis Thornton. Mm -hmm. And it seems like his photos have a bit of a photojournalistic Mm -hmm. Yeah touch than others do Definitely. not. Uh, is is he still alive? Have you spoken to him? He what is was, still alive. Did you get any feedback from him in the sense of what uh, what he was looking for when he was over there, what he was up to for, photographically? So this is the gentleman that didn't want his slides back. So uh, I still have ooh. them, which is interesting because okay. wow. I think they're really, really great. Mm-hmm. Um, he had mentioned that he worked for his division's magazine, which I don't think was a... I think it was maybe an internal magazine. I don't think it was something that was shared. It didn't come off as staged as someone that was shooting for a magazine that was over there. They were still similar to the rest of the, of the series that I was getting. So it felt like um, the base camp images and that sort of thing just a little bit more stylized, mm-hmm. Me- maybe meaning that he knew how to use his camera better, the, the depth of field, the exposure, everything was a little bit more on with his collection. So... I think he maybe was working with a little bit more of an idea while yeah. he was shooting. Yeah. Well, there's that one photo, I believe it's of him, of a soldier who's, his face is covered, he's lying down, and his, his shirt is open, and he's got the peace uh, medallion hanging there. And that's yeah. just a great shot. I mean, Definitely. that's someone who has a, a photographic eye mm-hmm. took that photo, for Definitely. sure. Definitely. And, um, and you mentioned some of the stories people are telling you. Are you thinking now about oral histories and, and taking in the stories and, and having them in text form as well, or that's down the line still? It would be down the line. I've done, but I would like to do that. I've done one, um, I have a friend that does uh, interviewing. She's working on, she's practicing her documentary skills. She's a photographer becoming a videographer, that Mm -hmm. sort of thing. And so we interviewed a friend of ours. His father served in Vietnam, and we, we just tried out sort of seeing what that would be like. And it was really interesting, and I'm looking forward to maybe editing that and sharing that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is really difficult with the age of these veterans and their locations, and they're scattered amongst the around the country. And it would be something that I would love to do. I think something that I thought of soon, so you better. I know. (laughs) And something that came to mind for me is that uh, it was about 20 years ago that there was a, a, a big uptick in interest in World War II. Um, and, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that a lot of the people who fought in World War II are now getting into their 60s and 70s, and now they're in their 90s, those that are even left. Um, and we're kind of at that same point in time with the Vietnam War. It's now getting towards where, you know, the kids that fought there are now people who are now retiring, going on Social Security, mm-hmm. becoming, you know, the elderly of our generation. And they too, in 20 years, you're going to have very few of them left. So it's kind of the same pattern you have. You know, we celebrated the greatest generation and all the books came out and the document. And now we're doing it with Vietnam. It seems to be more so than in the past. Definitely. That's what I'm seeing anyway. Well, also people get to a certain age too, and it's time to reflect. And it's time to talk about things that you haven't talked about for 30, 40 years. And the pictures really do look old. Yeah. They look great. Today. They really do. They're starting to look like pictures from another time. Have you gotten uh, media requests or people reaching out to you to use images? And how do you handle them? Um, I've gotten a few. I try to be very upfront about the fact that I don't maintain the copyright at the moment. I'm not trying to own the images. I keep every contributor in the loop in terms of any media request. I have a, a background in licensing images, so if someone wants to use an image commercially or for some of their own projects, I try to offer some insight on behalf of the contributor before I even contact them just to let them know that, you know, if there's any sort of money involved, this person has donated their slides for my project only mm-hmm. and it to be shared on this platform. So I, I try to kind of build a bridge with that. Um, 
I've had musicians interested in using images for album art, oh, yeah. authors interested in using them for cover art for books. And that was that's pretty much it for media usage outside of the project. And everything else has been sharing the project um, in, in its entirety on it. Do you see yourself it. becoming an agent of sorts for some of these photographers? Because, again, they may not be working professionals, and it seems like none of them are, mm -hmm. but there's value to something, a photograph that they took decades ago that cannot be reproduced, right. and it has a value to it. So could you see yourself at some point in time, maybe not intentionally, but becoming sort of a broker for these people? Sure. I mean, I think... Because I I dig them up almost by mm -hmm. getting them to send them to me and sharing them and bringing new light to them, I almost have a duty to kind of make sure that the images are right. being used properly and that that person is getting the most out of it that they can. So I'm kind of a little bit protective of them also. Mm. Sure. And um, have you is it is it all Kodachrome that's coming in? Is it can you talk a little bit about the type of film that was used and even the cameras? Have you found any information on that? I've seen. A lot of Kodachrome and a lot of Ektachrome. Mm -hmm. That's the two main um, slides that I've seen. I've noticed that some are, I think, brownies. Mm -hmm. They're being used because it's a square format. That or... would be, yeah, that would be actually, um, yeah, the Instamatics were little square pictures. Mm -hmm. I think it was 126 was the name of the film. So that was the format. So I've gotten some that are yeah. clearly that. Mm -hmm. um, I had one collection that was square, probably not a Hasselblad, but whatever the equivalent of, I would assume... Could have been the Ishika matter. Yeah, uh, something a little bit... Mamiya, something. There were three or... There were Rico. There were something a little about easier a dozen to travel. twin lenses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, for the most part, regular 35 millimeter as well. So I've seen photographs of the cameras. There's a couple collections that have the, the common image of a photographer taking a photograph of another photographer. Right. You know, that oh, sort of yeah, thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've yeah, been able yeah. to kind of zoom in and see what the cameras looked like. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, any thoughts on doing like a slideshow, projecting them and, and doing it the way it may have originally been intended to, to Ooh, show? Slideshow with slides. What a concept. <laughs> That's a, yeah. That's well, I guess pretty, you're sending a lot of them wow. back so you don't have them. But. I'm sending a lot of them back, but it would be cool <laughs> to show them as a, as a slideshow. I yeah. do have a Kodak slide projector that I actually found outside um, in the street in couple, Brooklyn. I found <laughs> like a really it, kind of one of the newer ones oh, yeah. and um, mm -hmm. it works. And I've, I've used it uh, for some of my family slides that I have as well. And I think it would be really a really great great way to show the collections would be in their original intention. And I'm assuming that a lot of these, well, I don't know. Do you have any information on whether these slides were then processed in Vietnam and the, the soldiers had them, showed them to their, their buddies, or everything was just shipped back or, or held till they got home? Well... The one clue that I have that they were sent back... Slide mounts? Is hmm. that they're in slide mounts. Yeah. And, no, and, and it would, it like, might say, would say Kodak or whoever processed mm -hmm, it would be mm -hmm. on there. Okay. And also, one gentleman told me that I was at, he was inquiring if I was interested in his slides. And I told him, of course, you know, you can send them to me. And he said, they're just photographs of me. Um, I had people take photographs of me and just sent them to my wife so she knew I was alive. Mm. Oof. Which made me think. Obviously, they were just getting sent back. Yeah. So I'd be interested to see if, if it, even if it was a whole carousel of just a self portrait or someone taking a picture of someone else in different locations. I think that would be really interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and outside of the vets themselves that are giving you photos, have you had any? I don't know. Recognition, comments, uh, anything you can discuss on that level? I've gotten a lot of positive feedback. Um, a lot of comments about. You know, it's about time that mm. people have seen these and, you know, offered respect in the way that this project is kind of um, putting us in a positive light. I've gotten a lot about that. Um, you didn't get any negative feedback. I you? haven't gotten any negative feedback yet. Hopefully I won't. Yeah, um, I don't see why you why. would, yeah. really. I don't get yeah. it. Yeah. When why I you? first started, I did receive um, a little bit of a cautionary email from a veteran who said, you know, please proceed he actually said, please proceed with caution. This is a really tough subject matter for a lot of people, and you want to make sure that you're, you know, doing everyone justice and sort of... Be sensitive. Yeah, be sensitive. And, and it definitely put a tone on the project for me, and it sort of made me feel like I had a really big responsibility that I had to do each veteran justice and not 
kind of go over anything too quickly and really just give them the, the moment that they deserve. Now, that said, did you come across any images that you say, no, this I won't show? I have. So because right now the project lives mostly um, in a internet platform, yeah. there's a Instagram page and Facebook and that sort of thing. I know how things can be shared and I know how images can be taken out of context. And I do have a category of images that I've decided not to put online. There are images of dead bodies inside a grave. There are images outside of a tank. And there's just like a, a pile of bodies that I think with the right context would make sense in a book with yeah. the proper wording. I mm -hmm. just don't think that that's something that the internet needs to have. You don't want the that out there to. that somebody could just pick up and run with. Of course. And play with. Okay, yeah. that yeah. makes sense. Any thoughts on maybe the distinctions you've seen between the photos from Vietnam and, and maybe photos you've seen from our, our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? I don't know if, you, if you've you know, looked at the work that is on Instagram by a lot of soldiers mm -hmm. who posted stuff. Any conclusions you can draw about what, I mean, it's a big question, but, you know, about what was photographed or even what was in the minds of soldiers at the time? Anything that you can kind of draw on? I think... I'm learning by looking at these images that in comparison to what I see now, I just see a lot of innocence in the photographs that I'm looking at, especially the base camp um, images. I'm just seeing like how young people really were when they were over there and how just innocent they look. Mm -hmm. And and just in what they're, like I said, what they're photographing, you know, they're photographing from a plane like they've never been to another country yeah. before. And I think I wouldn't say that the soldier now is, is more hardened. That's not really the word, but they seem to have been, I think from my experience, someone who is serving currently has probably made that decision and has decided to serve, whereas the draft had a lot of people that probably weren't planning this for their future. And I think that's also a little bit evident in the photographs. Um, I could tell you from personal experience, it was a big deal because I was eligible for the draft back then. The reason why I never went is I had a very high lottery number. It was a lotto system, and based mm -hmm. on your birth date, and I pulled 363, I was home free. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were the first, from, from 1 to 120, 140, you were pretty much going. Above that, it was dicey, but that end of it, I was free. So I, I didn't have to deal with it, but I know a lot of people that did, and a lot of my friends, older brothers, and a few cases, sisters went overseas, and I can tell you they all came back very different people, all of them. Yeah. I think that's a pretty interesting and fair analysis. I mean, because it's true. People didn't travel as much. You know, obviously images of the, the rest of the world weren't as common as they are now. And as a nation and as a, I think, a lot of innocence <laughs> was lost in those years. I mean, I was born in 1967, so the images of Vietnam are everything. You know, they're really what I was, was raised on, you know. Mm. So to see this is very interesting to me. When I when I saw you, you were you were showing this at the Bronx Documentary Center. Is there anything mm -hmm. coming up in that sense that you're going to be showing images or, or anything along those lines? I've been trying to sort of get everything that I have scanned and sent back and mm -hmm. kind of feel like I'm caught up. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to maybe talk about having um, maybe the basis for a book starting. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start a, sort of get that going and I'm interested in maybe working with some sort of historian or someone who studied the subject matter. Um, I'd like to scan some of the letters and mm -hmm. have those be part of it as long as the veterans are okay with that. Right. I right. think those kind of flatbed scan documents with the photographs would be really nice. Mm -hmm. The yeah. handwriting and mm -hmm. they've sent mm -hmm. me some of their enlisting photos oh, wow. and that sort of thing. Right. So I'd love to have all of that kind of be part of it. Right. Did you ever think that it would become something that this much a part of your life when you agreed to look at your friend's father's images? I think I think I had an idea that it was something that needed to be needed to be done. I think I th my another friend of mine's father is a marine and I just knew that there were so many photographs that hadn't been seen and hadn't been talked about and I think for example going to her house as a kid and talking to him briefly about the about the war would turn into like a two hour conversation. I just knew that this person probably like many others just wanted to tell their story. So I think I knew that there was a lot of, a lot of subject matter, a lot of people that really cared about this. And I had a feeling that it would turn into something 
a little bit bigger because I know there's so many people that are affected by this and there's so many kids of veterans and there's so many family members that have seen the struggles that they came back with and that they just dealt with a lot themselves um, being related to someone that served that I knew that the story needed to be told. I didn't know if it was going to be my project that would would do it or how it would evolve, but I did think that it was the time, like, like we were talking about, they're getting older, they may not be here for too much longer to share their story. So I knew that there was enough enough subject matter to really make it into something. All right. Okay. Uh, Kendra, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so the web address of everything that we're talking about today, where can people go if they want to see all of these photographs? So the project is at www.thevietnamslideproject.org. We have a Facebook page and we have an Instagram page that is the Vietnam Slide Project. Okay, and we've gone all over, and it's just, it's great stuff. It's, it was uh, refreshing and interesting to look at and absorb, and thank you for sharing the rest of it with us today. Thank you for having and me. And we encourage anybody to listening who may have slides or, oh, or yeah. family if, members yeah. or friends to get in touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you know anybody who has a collection of slides that should be part of this. Okay, now you have a destination. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Well, there you have it. Another episode for our growing archive of photocentric podcasts. If you are not a subscriber to our show, I will not publicly shame you, but you do know who you are. Um, so head on over to Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify and sign up. It is free and it is easy. We're going to be taking a week off, but when we return on April 12th, we have a terrific episode for you. Our guests are Stephen and Betty Wilkes, and we're going to be talking about Stephen's day to night series and his work for National Geographic. It was a terrific show. You're going to love it. As always, on behalf of Jason, John, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today. 